This video is brought to you by Brilliant. On Sunday, Turkey will go to the polls to elect both their parliament and president. For the last 20 years or so, Turkey's politics has been dominated by Recep Erdogan and his AKP party, but polls suggest that they could finally be on their way out. So ahead of the elections, we thought we'd take a look at whether Turkey's elections will be free and fair. Hint, probably not. And what this means for the opposition's chances on Sunday. So let's start off by defining a free and fair election. The term was apparently first used by the UN back in 1956, when they were observing an independence referendum in British Togoland, which ended up voting to become part of what is today Ghana, but it only really entered common usage in the 1990s. Previously, international organisations had mostly focused on just free elections. The European Convention on Human Rights, for example, only talks about the right to free elections, not fair ones. The term free and fair became popular in the 1990s, in part because it was when the UN really got into the habit of monitoring elections. The UN had played an important role in monitoring the independence referendums in the 1950s and 1960s, but it took a bit of a break from election monitoring in the 1970s and 1980s, before being brought back into service in the 1990s, when a wave of countries started transitioning from autocracies to democracies. It was probably no coincidence that this happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and at a time when the US had made promoting democracy an explicit foreign policy objective. Basically, in the 1990s, democracy was all the rage, and this created a demand for election observers, who started talking about free and fair elections. Annoyingly, there's no universally accepted definition of either free or fair here, but broadly speaking, free elections are elections where voters are free to cast votes without coercion, and fair elections are those where all the various groups and individuals have similar opportunities and the rules of the election are applied consistently. Obviously, because both these notions are fuzzy, there's going to be some overlap. But most people agree that fairness is a more demanding standard than freedom. In other words, generally all fair elections will also be free, but not all free elections will also be fair. This is why we sometimes hear about elections being free but not fair. For example, in Hungary and Russia. But you don't really hear about elections being fair but not free. Given that freedom is a lower bar than fairness, let's start by asking, will Turkey's election be free? Well, the short answer here is probably yes, insofar as the vast majority of Turkish citizens will be able to cast their ballots unobstructed. The election will probably be peaceful, and while Erdogan does try to suppress minority representation, especially when it comes to Kurds, he does this by banning Kurdish political parties, not by stopping Kurds from voting. So, the election might be free, but will it be fair? Well, as we see it, Turkey's election is unlikely to be fair, for at least two reasons. First, Erdogan has almost complete control over the judiciary. After the 2016 coup attempt, Erdogan dismissed any judge that he considered unfriendly or too close to Fethullah Gulen, the Islamic preacher that Erdogan considers responsible for the 2016 coup attempt. While these new judges don't explicitly identify as pro-Erdogan, the fact that, in 2020, nearly half of Turkey's 21,000 judges had less than three years' experience suggests that the new ones haven't been appointed on the basis of experience, but rather loyalty to Erdogan. This is why, unsurprisingly, Turkey's judicial system usually sides with Erdogan. Istanbul's opposition mayor, Ekrem Imamoglu, was banned from running by Turkey's Supreme Electoral Council, and various politicians from the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party have also been prevented from running. The council even overturned a long-running electoral convention, paving the way for 15 of Erdogan's AKP allies to use their ministries as campaign devices. The opposition candidate, Kemal Kılıç Darolu, has already said that he doesn't plan on appealing to the Supreme Electoral Council if he loses, because, again, in his words, it's controlled by Erdogan. This isn't a new phenomenon either. In 2014, Turkish courts blocked an opposition lawsuit into the Ankara mayoral election, which looked rigged. In the 2017 referendum, which Erdogan won with 51% of the vote, they made a last-minute change to how ballots were counted, 
And in 2019, they forced a rerun of Istanbul's mayoral election when it didn't go Erdogan's way. Second, Erdogan has almost complete control over the media. The vast majority of print and broadcast media outlets are owned by Erdogan allies, and independent media outlets are constantly fined and harassed by the authorities. The opposition has tried to get its message across via social media, but have been stymied by a vaguely worded law passed by Erdogan last October, which basically allows the government to penalise social media companies and users for anything they consider, quote, disinformation. In other words, anything they don't like. For example, Erdogan used the law to shut down Twitter after the earthquake. Erdogan has used his control over the media not only to criticise Kilic Durolu, but also to promote other opposition candidates, presumably because Erdogan wants to split the opposition vote, so that no candidate gets 50% of the vote in the first round. This would trigger a runoff election, presumably between Erdogan and Kilic Durolu, which Erdogan probably feels confident about winning. So you get the idea. While the election might be free, it almost definitely won't be fair, which is sort of unsurprising given that Erdogan and his AKP party have been consolidating their grip over Turkish civil society and the Turkish states for the best part of two decades. So what does this mean? Well, the main thing that it means is that there's a higher chance of some sort of political crisis if the result is close cut. If Kilic Durolu wins by a narrow margin, for example, then Erdogan might try to use his control of the courts and the Supreme Electoral Council to overturn the result, which would push Turkey into a constitutional crisis. Similarly, if Erdogan wins by a narrow margin, then there's a good chance that the opposition and their supporters will refuse the result, claiming, rightly, that the election wasn't fair in the first place, and that, without help from his buddies in the courts and the media, Erdogan would have lost. Essentially, the fact that the election isn't fair creates uncertainty about the legitimacy of the results, which means unless someone wins by a massive margin and the result is unambiguous, Turkey risks falling into a political crisis. What do the world's best politicians have in common? They're willing to learn something new every day. And if you think that sounds too hard or too time-consuming, or even just too overwhelming for you to do, then you haven't tried Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn maths and computer science in a fun and interactive way. That's because Brilliant has literally thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced maths to skills crucial in the modern world, like AI, data science, neural networks, and more, with new lessons added monthly. Like I said though, the real value here is that you can do this easily every day, truly committing to lifelong learning. Slowly, over time, you'll not only pick up new skills or get better at maths, but you'll also feel the satisfaction that comes with bettering yourself and staying ahead. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, click on the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.